1992, a sequel to the highly acclaimed box office hit Aliens was released. It was directed by an up-and-coming and very sought-after new director named David Fincher, who had won Best Director awards for his Express Yourself and Vogue music videos for Madonna. It had a script which had been worked on by famed cyberpunk author William Gibson, had two critically acclaimed and commercially successful prequels which had also created the greatest female protagonist of all time, a protagonist who had gone on to become one of the most popular heroines in cinema history. It also featured one of the most famous, iconic and threatening monsters in all of cinema. Everything spelled success for Alien 3. But the movie was considered a box office flop in North America, not even making the same money as its predecessors and was panned left, right and centre by reviewers. Even its young director disowned the movie. Welcome to another episode of Trouble Productions, where I look at movies which had famously difficult productions and try to examine exactly what went wrong. After the success of Aliens, 20th Century Fox approached Brandywine Productions to make a sequel. Guyler and Hill, who had been the producers on every movie, didn't want to retread the same ground as before and so decided that the focus of the third movie should be on the Wayland yutani Corporation and why they were so intent on using the Xenomorphs as a biological weapon. Alien 3, everybody wanted to make the sequel to Alien, kind of except us. We weren't so, uh, I mean, we were happy to do it, but we weren't all that enthused. Because we thought, you know, what do you do with this one to make it different? You know, the whole idea of you can't do something that's just going to be a reheat of one or two. We knew we wanted to carry the, the company's duplicity uh, and need for this weapon. They devised a two-part treatment which would be developed into two movies, with the first part being focused on a battle between Will and Utani and a colony of space socialists, and part two being an epic war between alien warriors mass-produced by expatriated humans. The first part reduced Ripley to a cameo role and bumped up Hicks to the protagonist of the story with Ripley returning in the final part to take the protagonist's role again. The story was a metaphor for the Cold War, which Weaver supposedly liked and so she expressed her interest despite the decreased role for what would have been Alien 3. Fox wasn't so convinced, but did agree to fund the development of the story asking for two conditions. One, the third and fourth movies would be shot back to back to keep production costs down. And two, Brandywine should attempt to convince Ridley Scott to direct the two movies. Brandywine did approach Scott, who was supposedly interested in returning to the franchise, but unfortunately his schedule was full. With the initial concept ready, and the main star almost on board, the next task for Guyler and Hill was to hire a writer to turn their idea into a full script. Looking for someone to give the script a real sense of identity, they approached William Gibson, whose novel Neuromancer had been a landmark book in the cyberpunk genre to write a draft of the screenplay. With a potential writer's guild strike on the horizon, Gibson was ordered to produce a full screenplay in just three months. Gibson decided to base his screenplay around Hill and Guyler's ideas as much as possible and produced something which he referred to as Space Commies Hijack Alien Eggs, Big Problem in More World. The story begins after the events of Aliens, with Hicks, Newt, Ripley and Bishop all aboard the Sulaco, which is then boarded and towed to a nearby space station called Anchor Point. Most people online tend to refer to this version of the screenplay as Anchor Point for that reason. The story had Ripley in a coma, but with Hicks exploring the station and eventually uncovering the Wayland yutani Corporation had been breeding and engineering the Xenomorph in secret for military purposes an idea that would eventually be recycled for Alien Resurrection. Later, the station would be overrun with aliens and Hicks would have to team up with various factions of humans to destroy the aliens and save the station. The movie would then end on the teaser note that Hicks and Cole would need to track the aliens to their homeworld and extinct them at the source, or the cycle would just keep repeating. The script was much more similar to Cameron's tone and contained squads of marines battling aliens with pulse rifles and flamethrowers and in general focused heavily on action instead of the horror elements of Ridley Scott's original movie. Hill and Guyler were a bit disappointed by the screenplay, commenting that while it was a well-paced and executed screenplay they felt that it was still missing something 
and was also lacking the Gibson cyberpunk aesthetic for which they'd hired him in the first place. There were lots of versions, none of which were particularly successful, we thought. By this point, director Rennie Harlan had been hired to direct on the strength of his work on Nightmare on Elm Street 4. He had expressed interest in pursuing ideas of visiting the alien homeworld, something that would be recycled by Prometheus 20 years later, and also an invasion on Earth, which had been teased in the trailer. Eventually, Harlan lost interest and left the film because he felt the studio just wanted to do the same thing aliens had done, and he was more interested in pursuing new ideas. Uh, we talked, you know, to... I think, who, who was it? Rennie Harlan, somebody we actually hired at one point. When I signed on to do Alien 3, my first principle was that I'm not going to copy Ridley Scott or Jim Cameron. They are fantastic filmmakers, and I, I felt that if, if I could bring something new into the series, then it was really worth doing. My original approach was that we would go to where the aliens actually come from. We would place the story on the planet where they really originate from and really explain what they are. Not being entirely happy with the script, Hill and Geiler offered Gibson the chance to revise his draft, to which Gibson declined. On recommendation from Holland before he left, the studio hired Eric Redd to revise the script. His revision had all the survivors from Aliens die off screen, and an entirely new set of characters face off in a war with the aliens in small town America. In space. An idea that would be recycled by Aliens vs Predator 2. Hill and Guile have fired Red from the production for deviating too much from their original concept. Not that it bothered Red too much, as the constant studio interference led to him saying that the script was the result of conference calls and not writing, and claiming that the script was complete crap. Both Harlan and Red then left the production. Next up was the eventual writer and director of the Riddick series, David Tui. Tui was told by the studio to begin with Gibson's original script and go from there. With the many analogies and metaphors to the Cold War now being out of date, he made some changes to the script and turned it in. Among the changes were the fact that the space station was now a planet, populated by a penal colony, upon which the Whalen yutani Corporation were conducting illegal experiments on the inmates. Then President of Fox, Joel Roth, didn't like the idea of Ripley being sidelined and ordered a rewrite. This had the effect of removing Michael Bean's Hicks from the script entirely, something which he was pretty upset about and would lead later to him only allowing Fox to use his photograph in the movie and nothing else. She had been over to the Pinewood Studios, and she said she saw my character, Hicks, made up of like a dummy character of me, laying on the ground with my chest opened up as if the alien came out of me. I said, oh, that's interesting. So I called my agent, who's Ed Lamato, who's like way up there, and I said, Ed, what the fuck, man? I mean, it's one thing not to be in it. It's another thing for me to have had fucking that alien come back in me and have it come out of my chest with, you know, blah, blah, blah. I said, no fucking way can they do this, Ken. And he said, no, man, that's your likeness, and they can't, so on and so forth. So he called them up, and he said, I don't know how far they got, but they were told that they, they couldn't do that, and we would, get, we would sue them. And so first they started saying, well, can we pay Michael for this? Can we pay? We'll, we'll pay him a certain amount of money. I said, I do not. I don't care how much money you have. I was really stupid back then. I don't care how much money you have, that alien is not coming out of my chest, okay? And uh, so that was that. So then we got a call, you know, a month or two later that they wanted to use my photograph. I said, now you can pay me. <laughs> so they did. So I, I got paid almost as much for that photograph as I did for the first movie that I did. At this point, Weaver was called to see if she was still interested in the movie. After being offered a $5 million fee for the movie, she agreed to do it under two conditions. The first condition was that the story needed to be improved substantially, and the second condition was no guns. This likely stemmed from Weaver's experience in James Cameron's Aliens, in which she characterised guns as being the real stars of the movie. In fact, I'd read the script so quickly and I'd been so busy that I usually, I get excited when I read a script. I don't always read all the stage directions. 
And so very early on, we had this scene suddenly where it was all about guns. And I said, well, Jim, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I don't think I quite noticed all this gun stuff. You know, I'm really against guns. I'm really for gun control. And um, he said, I think you better reread the script, <laughs> reading the stage directions. Of course, it's all guns, all the time. And, um, <laughs> And as an advocate for gun control, she said that she was never really comfortable being in a movie which was so close to a war movie. Tui then went away to produce another draft with much more Ripley and a bit less guns. Well, a, a lot less guns. Actually, zero guns. He'll then approach New Zealand director Vincent Ward to see if he'd be interested in coming onto the project to rewrite after seeing his movie The Navigator A Medieval Odyssey. Ward initially rejected the invitation stating that he had no interest in sequels, but later accepted when Hill and Geiler allowed him to create his own script in parallel with Tui's rewrite. Ward pitched an idea which the studio seemed interested in and brought in John Fasenau to put his pitch into a full script. At this stage, there were now two completely separate scripts, neither of which was ready for shooting and both of which were completely different. As a courtesy between writers, Fasenor got in touch with Tui to let him know that he was now working on the script for Alien 3, unaware that the studio and producers hadn't told Tui. Tui got a bit angry with Fox and called them to complain, at which point the studio tried to convince him that Fasenor and Ward were working on Alien 4 and not Alien 3. Fasano denied this and told Tui that he was writing Alien 3, and Tui recalled the studio again, only for them to this time admit that they were lying and tried to convince Tui that his script would be used on Alien 4 instead. Feeling a bit angry and annoyed at the lack of professionalism, Tui finished his script quickly so that he could collect his fee and then he quit the production. Ward and Fasano's version had the movie set on a planet made entirely of wood, with a group of monks who would come to see Ripley's arrival as a temptation of their faith an idea which was kept in the final movie. Do you have any faith, sister? Not much. Well, we've got a lot of faith here. Enough even for you. And also to see the alien as God's method of punishment for their faltering faith. The movie would also see Ripley sacrifice herself in the film's finale to kill the alien. The script had a lot of Judeo-Christian imagery and themes and is regarded among critics as one of the best sci-fi screenplays never made. Personally, I think the idea of non-violent monks hiding in a giant library trying desperately to run away from the monster while Ripley tries to figure out how to kill herself on a planet made out of wood against an alien whose only weakness is fire and bleeds acid sounds pretty shit. Fox and the producers also seemed a bit unsold, with Fox asking for an alternate ending where Ripley lived and Hill and Guyler realising that the wooden planet full of Christian librarians might look cool, but ultimately it was never going to pump anyone's nads. John Fasano was consistently asked by the studio and producers to try and delicately balance Ward's somewhat wacky vision of the film with the studio's more commercial requests. The results at trying to do this were... questionable. When it came to the issue of how to end the movie, he decided to visit Weaver in an attempt to get both her perspective and to have her come round to the idea of Ripley being alive at the end of the movie. Her response was less than enthusiastic. You know, and also what was really fucked up was that from the beginning of this process, Sigourney said, look, I don't care what you guys do, but at the end of this movie, I have to die. Because I fought this thing three times and beat it three times, and I don't want to do another one of these movies. And I said, well, what if it's a huge hit? She goes, well, they'll bring me back as a clone or say it was a dream. I mean... An idea which was recycled a few years later in the Weaver-produced Alien Resurrection. A movie which rather than resurrecting the franchise, shoveled dirt onto its coffin and then pissed on its grave. Anyway, Fastenau went back to the studio, turned in the draft where Ripley died, only for the studio to say, You know, they got our script and they're like, you killed Sigourney. And I said, well, she wants to die. And they said, no. Fox flat out told him no. And so he went back and like before, gave the studio what they wanted. And like before, it's questionable. So I had the priest give her CP, uh, like CPR and suck the alien out of her esophagus into himself and then he jumps in the fire or whatever. I am not making that up. 
Fascino did, however, add something to the alien mythology that I always found interesting. The reason that the alien was a quadruped was because it had hatched from a quadrupedal animal. He stated that it made sense that the way the alien adapts to its environment so quickly is the melding of host and alien DNA, which allowed it to take on characteristics of its host and survive in any environment. When Ward refused to compromise on the wooden planet idea, he was fired. At the same time, Weaver told Fox that she wouldn't go any further unless Ripley dies at the end of the movie. Hill and Guyler did their best to try and make the scripts work, but felt creatively drained and decided that if they couldn't have one good script, why not have five bad ones and hired another writer to write another draft? Larry Ferguson came on board and made a draft in two months, which everyone hated. In particular Weaver, who felt that he wrote Ripley like a pissed off gym teacher. Ferguson was then fired. Considering Weaver had a contract clause stating that only Hill and Guyler could write the final draft anyway, they decided to just put all the scripts through a shredder, cover them in glue, throw them at a wall, and whatever was still stuck there would be the script. And so, a new script was being cobbled together out of the remnants of the 14 dead ones. After chasing away the big budget feature director, they then chased away the artistic auteur both times because the directors resisted the big Hollywood machine. The studio thought, why not hire someone who can't resist their request because he doesn't have the same professional clout. After flicking through their Rolodex of young directors that were yet to make a feature and desperate enough to allow themselves to be pushed around, they landed on young yet highly talented and award-winning music video director, David Fincher. Fincher was hired with five weeks until shooting began. 10 drafts of three screenplays that nobody liked and none of which were finished, and already having spent $17 million of his $40 million budget before he'd even read the title of the movie. Oh, and I forgot to mention that they'd already built the sets based on Ward and Fasano's script. Fincher inherited a chalice so poisoned that if Jesus had just taken a whiff of its pungent stench, he would have instantly dropped dead. Fincher came on board with the assumption that since he had no script, no shooting schedule, and only partially built sets, that the studio would give him more time. That turned out to be a mistake, as the studio had set what they considered to be an unmovable deadline 642 writers ago when they released a teaser trailer during Ward's original pitch. I always felt that Alien 3 was a movie that initially, as a studio, we set out to make a release date and not make a movie. The teaser had nothing to do with Ward's ideas. It didn't have anything to do with Gibson's script, or Tui's script, or any of the scripts, in fact. It wouldn't even bear any resemblance to Fincher's finished film either. It was an absolute piece of marketing garbage, filled with nothing but false promises. Filming then began at Pinewood Studios in England in January of 1991, giving Fincher roughly one year to film, edit, and market a movie, which didn't even have a script. He requested 93 days of principal photography. The studio gave him 70, which was just under half the amount that the studio gave James Cameron to make Aliens. At least the shoot itself was completely problem free. And this would be a much shorter video if that were true. Despite his youth and lack of industry clout, the cast seemed to really engage with Fincher, as he seemed to have great confidence in his ability and vision for what the movie should be, and most, if not all, went along with what Fincher said. He made a brand new friend in Sigourney Weaver almost immediately by suggesting that Ripley should die at the end of the movie, something which Ward and Fasano had been trying to persuade the studio to accept almost from the beginning. Weaver admired his willingness to be daring and go in a different direction, even persuading her to shave her head for the film. I finally said toward the end of the meeting, so how do you, how do you picture Ripley in this movie? And he said, I don't know, bald? <laughs> and that was the moment where I fell in love with him because I thought, that's such a great idea. Once shooting actually began, Fincher won the crew over with ideas that were completely new to both the franchise and the cast and crew. He works with. I would never. I thought it was his first film, and uh, where he's placing the camera. I've never seen it done that way. His idea seemed very cinematic. Even then, he joked, he said, yeah, this is a sort of Hitchcockian bit. 
you know, and here comes John Ford. And so there are all these little nods, you know, and it was a lovely energy, you know, it was the kind of the energy of somebody confident and um, someone who was a fan. While previously the shooting style for the movies had been more like traditional horror and action, with the film shot from either head height or just above, and lit from above as well, Fincher wanted to go with a more forced perspective closer to the ground to give the audience the experience of the alien and help them disassociate with the human characters a bit more. He also introduced the first person xenomorph cam for scenes when it was prowling around and chasing people, which he shot with Steadicam. This would be the only time he would shoot anything handheld. As is Fincher's style, the film has quite a nihilistic tone to both the visuals and to the overall production, which gave it a very unique visual identity, completely separate from the first two movies and totally separate from any movies that would follow it as well. While most people aren't really keen on Alien 3, it really is the only movie of the entire franchise with its own individual look. Fincher would prove to be a demanding director on set despite his young years. But actors repeatedly stated that he was great to work with. Tywin Lannister even stated that he knew from the very first day that Fincher was a very talented director. He is extraordinary, you know, utter total confidence, which he inspires from the people that he works with. David Fincher is a genius, basically, for whom I would jump off London Bridge. I trust him implicitly. I mean, I, work, I stand awestruck, actually, watching Fincher work. He is extraordinary. Coming from an effects background, Fincher understood the demands that compositing could put on a movie, which helped the effect shots greatly. However, his suggestion to use Greyhound whippets in costume for the effect shots of the alien was met with some scepticism, with pretty good reason. But Fincher wasn't stubborn, he recognised his mistake and from that point on deferred to the effects team whenever it came to an effects shot. The effects team consistently referenced just how much Fincher would push them to think outside of what had been done before, leading the team to be one of the first movies to create a system of monitoring exactly how the camera moved during shooting, so that the rod puppet footage which would be composited later would match it down to the slightest movement. This technique is common today, but it really was incredibly rare at the time. This would be repeated with many effect shots, where the techniques for filming the way Fincher wanted just didn't exist, so the team would have to invent it so that they could execute what Fincher had in his mind. One way they did this was by inventing a brand new type of laser disc compositing, which they could use to immediately composite footage on top of the blank plate dailies from the main set. We also developed a laser disc uh, composite system so that we could take the uh, material that was shot at one frame a second or 48 frames a second and reconfi reconfigure that to 24 frames a second so that we could then put it with the background and see immediately after we shot a take on the stage we could then composite it in video with the background and see if it works if, and if he missed if he's supposed to be noshing on a particular actor and he, and he misses it then you can see, so you, you then move him over and he does this over here, or his feet placement and all that kind of stuff can be controlled. And uh, it's, it was pr a really powerful tool and, it, and it's never been able, nobody's ever been able to do it as w uh, with such facility. While this seems normal now as computers have made compositing fast and easy, at the time it didn't actually exist and all compositing had to be done when principal photography had finished which sometimes contributed to compositing where it was obvious that the effect and the actors weren't sharing the same physical space. Fincher is a director well known for his striking visual style in all of his movies, and that style is always facilitated by good working relationships with talented cinematographers, who know how to light and shoot the scene to achieve the look that Fincher is going for. Members of the cast stated that the only time they saw Fincher give full and uninterrupted attention was when speaking with cinematographer Jordan Cronenworth. He's the only person I've ever seen David have reverential respect for is Jordan. A well-respected industry veteran who had also been the cinematographer who had given Blade Runner its iconic look. Just a few weeks into shooting, and the line manager had noticed that Cronenworth exhibiting telltale symptoms of Parkinson's disease, something that he noticed because his dad had passed away from the disease not too long before. Knowing that the grueling shoot could end up being fatal for Cronenworth, 
he persuaded him to leave the film to preserve his health. They then hired Alex Thompson, who had been the cinematographer for Ridley Scott's underappreciated fantasy movie Legend a few years earlier. Fincher still had no script, a bunch of sets for a different movie, an extremely restrictive release date, and he had to start from scratch with a new cinematographer. As the shoot started to go even further over budget and behind schedule, Fincher, Geiler and Hill had started to have arguments about the script, or lack thereof. When Fincher suggested ideas to Fox executive John Landau, Landau liked what Fincher had to say, and this caused tension between Fincher, Hill and Geiler. Eventually, Hill and Geiler got tired of what they thought was the studio undermining their authority, and flew back home to Los Angeles to run the production from their offices, leaving Fincher to finish the script himself, often having to make it up scene by scene as they were shooting it. This proved to be both a blessing and a curse, as he no longer had to run ideas by Hill and Geiler anymore, and could simply execute whatever he wanted straight away. But the lack of producers on set suddenly exposed Fincher to the three times daily phone calls from John Landau to constantly check on the production and request financial cutbacks, to which Fincher would have to waste precious shooting time justifying the things that he was supposed to be shooting at that moment. As time passed and everyone became more and more stressed, Fincher clashed with Landau more and more, culminating in him telling Landau to ship him home and take his name off this piece of shit. This eventually led to Landau halting production and ordering everyone to return to Los Angeles and assemble a rough cut so that they could see what was missing and what was needed. It's worth pointing out that Fincher knew exactly what was missing and what was needed and had repeatedly asked to be left alone to do his job so that he could fix it. But at the request of the studio, he closed production down before they wrapped principal photography and flew back to LA to assemble a rough cut. After assembling all the rough footage together, the film ran for just over three hours, and the Fox executives were not happy. They ordered numerous scenes to be significantly cut, including all scenes of gore. After having a test screening filled with 18-year-old college students, they also ordered most of the subplots in the film to be cut as well, leaving many of the movie's key moments needing reshoots to explain how they happened. Fincher wasn't pleased because the only thing that he felt he needed to film was one extra scene to help with the conclusion of the film. The studio refused and ordered him to make the changes that they requested. By this point, Sigourney Weaver had started to grow her hair back and had a clause in her contract that stated that she gets a 40 grand bonus if she has to shave it again. Rather than spend the money, which Fincher knew would just make Landau angry, he hired a specialist to make a custom bald cap with stubble growth at a cost of $16,000. The cap needed precise placement due to the visible hairline and would often slip and move during shoots, forcing constant retakes of scenes and wasting even more time. Finally feeling like he'd pretty much completed principal photography, against the odds, Fincher then started to edit the movie, only to be told by Fox that they wanted the movie to have a sub two hour runtime, and then it could be played more often in theatres and increase profits. At which point, Fincher left the production and refused to do any further work on the movie. The movie was then cobbled together without Fincher. The film was eventually finished and released. It was heavily edited by the studio to remove more graphic elements to reduce its age rating than it could be played for a younger audience, and also heavily edited for length than it could be played more times in one day at theatres. Both of these measures were to increase the profits of the movie at the cost of the quality of the movie. The studio seemed to not really care if the movie was good, only that it existed and was released on time. Instead of being a big hit like the studio expected, its North American release was a complete flop and was ripped to pieces by critics blemishing the young director's image, with Fincher taking the blame for the poor story and writing choices even though they weren't his choices. Still under contract to promote the movie, Fincher gave only one interview, to Mark Berman, where he did his best to be kind to the movie, but the whole thing reads like someone who knows that they can't say what they really want to say. Looking at it in the role of communicator, obviously in a lot of cases I didn't get my ideas across. I'm taking that rap. 
But I'm so happy with the monsters and the special effects and the look of the film and the performances and what people were able to do with whatever minimal prep they had. I'm very happy with that. So I don't want to seem ungrateful. I'm not embarrassed by the film. Unlike the cast and other members of the crew, Fincher never attended screenings. He didn't do press junkets and he only gave that one solitary interview. And even today he's pretty apprehensive to discuss the movie. Though he did give a bit of insight a few years later when speaking on stage to Mark Salisbury at BFI South Bank. I mean, I moved there in 1984 and started propaganda films in 1987. So I'd been doing commercials and videos for 8 to 10 years before anybody gave me a shot at making a movie. And I wish they hadn't. The film we can't mention. Yeah, let's not. But there's this fantastic quote I found, where you said of Alien 3 that a lot of people hated Alien 3, but no one hated it more than you did. I had to work on it for two years, got fired off it three times, and I had to fight for every single thing. No one hated it more than me. To this day, no one hates it more than me. At the risk of opening old wounds, what did you take from that experience that has subsequently helped you in your Hollywood career? I'd always had this naive idea that everybody wants to make movies as good as they can be, which is stupid. So I learned on this movie that nobody really knows, so therefore nobody has to care, so it's always going to be your fault. I'd always thought, well surely you don't want to have the 20th Century Fox logo over a shitty movie. And they were like, well as long as it opens. In other territories the movie performed much better, and as the movie went to home video it gained more of a cult following but fans of the franchise still blamed Fincher for the fact that Alien 3 simply wasn't Alien or Aliens. Despite its problems, Alien 3 is the only movie in the entire franchise to be nominated for an Academy Award for its special effects. But the movie was such a nightmare for Fincher that he doesn't talk about it anymore. And after he left the production, he refused feature picture work for almost two years and went back to directing music videos. It was only when producer Arnold Copelson threw a copy of a screenplay titled Seven on his desk that Fincher was tempted out of retirement. But that's a story for another video. Thanks for watching, and I hope this has been an enjoyable video. 